from Waymo, an Alphabet brand, which is blowing its competition out of the water in the self-driving car industry. Please welcome to the stage Director of Operations at Waymo, Sean Stewart, for his keynote, Autonomous Mobility. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, thank you. Wow. Thank you for having me. Thanks to the Unbound team for uh, giving us an excuse to come out to Singapore today, which has been great. Today, we're going to spend about 15 minutes talking a little bit about Waymo and the autonomous vehicle space in regards to the progress that has happened in the past, as well as the status of technology moving forward. For those of you who haven't heard of Waymo, don't worry. It's a pretty new company, and so there's certainly an excuse as a new and upcoming brand that was launched in December of 2016. We're a company focused mainly on self-driving technology. We say internally that we're focused on building a better driver, not a better car or a better bus or a better truck, but a better driver to operate on various different platforms and use cases around the world. And our history started in 2009, even though the company existed uh, just officially in the, at the end of 2016. We're part of the Alphabet Group and started actually as part of Google X, one of the divisions within Google that focuses on what we call moonshots, or solving large problems with innovation that are impacting mankind around the world. At the end of 2016, we felt that the technology was actually ready for commercialization. And as a result, we focused on moving the company from outside of Google X and to the mainstream as its own separate company. Like every moonshot, we're trying to solve a big problem, something that we feel can change the world and improve the lives of its citizens. And so at Waymo, or previously the Google self-driving car project, the question being, what are we solving for? Or what problem have we been focused on? And it comes back to some key concerning statistics. The first, regarding North America, is that 40,000 people die every year on American roads. Globally, 1.3 million people die on the roads every year. And for perspective, that's the equivalent of a 737 crashing every hour of every day all year long. And these trends, unfortunately, haven't been declining with safer vehicles and safer roads, but actually have been increasing at fatality rates. And a lot of the reasons for this come down to human behavior. 94% of accidents where a collision occurs are cited as being human error or due to human choice. These factors are getting worse, starting with traditional issues like speeding and drunk driving, but have moved on to new distractions like tablets in vehicles, people on their iPhones, also recreational and, and uh, prescription medication causing drowsiness in drivers. And so we focused on this problem for four major impacts we thought could have a change in the world. The first is making the roads you all drive on safer. The second was giving mobility to people who may not have access to mobility today, whether it's due to cost or due to access uh, with disabilities. The third is giving you all back time. I commute from Oakland to Mountain View every day. It can be anywhere between 90 minutes and two hours one way. And there's certainly a lot of other things I'd like to do with that time, other than driving 15 mile an hour in bumper to bumper California traffic. And the last one is the efficiency and dollars we feel we can change in businesses by providing scalability and reliability in the drivers that they employ in their businesses. And so the Waymo story, starting in 2009, has evolved across multiple platforms, multiple vehicle types. You can see here, back at, way at the back, is our first vehicle from 2009 on a Toyota Prius platform. That year, Larry Page gave us one challenge. Build a car that can drive 10 routes that I pick out of, out of 100 miles in length each, and you can do so without any disengage or any involvement of the human driver. That was the first challenge in 2009, and the project has evolved since then to cover the Lexus RX 350 you see there, onto the Firefly, the more iconic self-driving car that we built for Mountain View testing, and the first car with no steering wheel, no pedals, and drove a blind man from his Austin hotel to his medical appointment in 2015 on public roads in Texas all the way through to the main vehicle you see there, our minivan, a Pacifica from FCA, which is the top of the line in regards to our hardware and software that is out driving on the roads today. And so if you are new to the space of autonomy, just learning a little bit today about self-driving cars, there's some key frameworks that you should know about and understand. The framework is looking at levels of autonomy, which are designed in five key categories. 
Level one autonomy, probably every single one of you has experienced in your life so far. If you've driven a car with cruise control, that's a level one functionality of autonomous vehicles. It maintains one function, the speed, and that's the sole, pur sole purpose of that tool. But L, the L levels have increased over time recently with L2 and L3 products actually hitting the market. The difference here for L2 and 3 is we call them driver assist products. And these are vehicles where the car can maintain a range of different functions. It can accelerate, brake all the way to a full stop, re-accelerate, stay in lanes. But at all time, the human occupant is required to pay attention and to be ready to take over the vehicle with a couple seconds notice. A key aspect of the L1, 2, and 3 technology is that the human must be there and prepared to take over with minimal notice. What we're focused on at Waymo is L4 technology. This is the point where if any of you got to the conference today, realized you left your laptop at home, you could put your laptop, your wife or husband could drop it in an autonomous L4 vehicle, and that car could drive here to the sands without any human in the vehicle, completely autonomously. And that's the L4 status that we've been focused on since creation. Now, many times when we give this update or the focus areas, the first question is, why not slowly peel the onion? Why not roll out an L2 solution so that some of my driving can get taken care of, and then an L3 solution? And this comes back to 2010, when we actually took what we call at Google dog food, where we give employees our test products and allow them to experience them for the first hand and to give feedback on the experience they have with the vehicle in this case. So in 2011, we gave a set of Google employees a vehicle that could drive Highway 101 from San Francisco to Mountain View completely autonomously. We handpicked them, we trained them, we put video uh, monitoring systems in the car, and we told them we would be watching them at all times to make sure they paid attention and were never negligent in being prepared to take over the L2 or L3 solution. What do you think happened? Well, as you might have guessed, the drivers were incredibly distracted. The first one here, texting, waving to a few people as they pass, just showing off the fact that his car is driving for him on the freeway. The next guy got a little bit worse. He got out a laptop, he started to charge it, he eventually writes a few emails, getting a little bit concerning because do you think he's ready to take over the vehicle at any time? The next lady did her entire makeup routine on the way to work. Eyelashes and makeup all complete, driving 20 to 40 miles an hour depending on the traffic. But the most concerning came at the end, where someone fell asleep for 27 minutes on the freeway, driving 60 miles an hour or 100 kilometers an hour. And this was the big pivot or key conclusion for us. We, including myself, are not ready to babysit cars. We can't be the ones necessary for the technology failure, that the right solution in the right hands is an L4 solution, where the customer or the rider or the owner of the vehicle is not necessary and is not required to pay attention. Because our testing proved that humans just aren't capable over extended periods of time of focusing on the behavior of a car when they're unnecessary. And so over the last nine years, we've been driving in public streets throughout the US, 20 different cities. We've amassed close to 7 million miles. We'll hit 7 mi million miles this week. And what that means is at the 6 million mark, we've driven 300 human lifetimes of adult driving. But this isn't it. This isn't all the testing we do, and certainly isn't all the key testing that's required to finalize this technology. We also do real-world simulation in what we call CarCraft, or a simulation environment that's built at Google and Waymo, and allows us to test on every day the equivalent of 25,000 cars driving 24 hours a day to understand how they handle situations that we have experienced in the real world, but with variations or experiences that we've never encountered in the real world, but know the car will one day. The third category of testing we do is that we have a pro closed circuit test location in California where we do the high risk situations that maybe the car will never experience because they only occur every few millions of miles. Run a red light with a motorcycle, have a child run out in front of a 45 mile an hour car. We do these testings, obviously not with humans at risk, but to understand just how the car would handle that situation that hopefully none of us here ever actually encounter. But it's not all about software. This isn't just a race about designing the system for driving, maneuvering. There's also key elements of hardware that Waymo designs and develops and builds ourselves, mostly in California, for the vehicle that you see operating on the roads today in the US. 
It starts with that big center yellow ring, the BFD, the big dome, as we call it. And the dome includes both LiDAR, one of the key technologies from a hardware perspective, as well as the vision set of cameras that allow the car to see different objects and categorize them when maneuvering through the city streets. We have LiDARs, three on the front of the vehicle for different angles of perception, and these are short-range LiDAR. The LiDAR on the top is a long-range LiDAR and can see the object the size of a basketball from about three to 400 yards in distance. The LiDAR sees 360 degrees, day or night, never becomes drunk, never becomes distracted. But on top of that, we add the technology of radar to four points of the vehicle as an additional level of strength in perception that the vehicle will encounter. And so on the next slide, we'll show you what the car sees in the real world. On the bottom, you're going to see the human perception. And what you should look for is when do you first spot the woman who's about to run into the street? Because from when the video starts, the car has already identified her with a yellow box, which you can see up on the top. So you can see the yellow box in the front right, uh, top right-hand side. That's the woman the car identified, already slowed down for, and then she decides to run into the street to save her chihuahua, who she's walking off the leash. The car replans its route, maneuvers around the object, continues safely through on to the next intersection. The vehicle never speeds, slows down for every school zone, deaccelerates for every crosswalk, stops at every stop sign. It understands and covers every key regulation on the roads today. And if you want to learn more than just this 15-minute segment, you can actually go to our website and review our detailed safety report that was submitted to the California government on how we've developed our vehicle, the process of getting there, and why we feel confident it's a great application to improve the lives of citizens around the world. And so most recently, last year, we did a survey in the US, 3,000 people using a range of survey tools, and we asked them one question. When do you think you'll see self-driving cars in your neighborhood with nobody behind the steering wheel, a completely vacant vehicle? The number one answer we received was around 2020. The actual reality is that we started doing this in October of 2017, and we'd like to show you the videos of it now.
so what you just saw was oh, thanks. And what you just saw was Waymo employees, and six October of 2017 in Phoenix, they've been able to use completely driverless cars without safety drivers in the vehicle to go from point to point using an app that we developed and allows them to select a destination and hail a vehicle. But it hasn't just been our employees. We actually opened a program called the Early Rider Program and allowed members of the Phoenix public to sign up to use our vehicles day to day, free of charge, to provide their feedback on how they experience the car and what their feedback is on how to improve the offering today. This includes taking mothers to work, fathers to the grocery store. We drop kids off at school every day, take them to soccer practice, all in a way that has their family members safe, that we're taking them without a stranger in the vehicle and actually delivering them to their point of destination safely. But this isn't it for us. We're starting to scale the offering in Phoenix, invite more and more people into the offering until launching a public driverless service where residents in the, in the Arizona town of Phoenix will be able to use our vehicles to get anywhere they desire with a click of a button on their phone. But we haven't been able to achieve all of this on our own. We've developed a range of partnerships. We're focused on building the driver, we work with everybody else in all the other aspects that they're specialists on that we haven't focused on. We work with FCA with up to 60,000 of those Pacificas available to us. We've partnered with Jaguar on their new uh, electric vehicle platform. And we've partnered with AutoNation and Avis for the maintenance of the vehicles to ensure that we build new technicians, new skills, and people are able to understand and work with this new category of technology to adapt and change the role they've played in automation and the auto industry. And so every day when the cars return from servicing the different customers and employees, it's the Avis team that cleans them, puts them back on the road, completes the short-term maintenance, fuels them, and they sleep at Avis locations throughout the Phoenix city. And so with that, we're excited to bring this technology to more and more cities around the world, to partner with more and more businesses who can bring this technology to life and start to deliver on those four areas of promise that the Google X project began with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean.